Did you know that estrogen going down as we go into menopause is one of the reasons why cholesterol can go up? And so that raises the question, does hormone therapy work for improving cholesterol in menopause? Hi, I'm Dr. Patricia Mills, medical doctor transforming women's hormone health through natural root cause solutions. Welcome to the Wild Wisdom Show. Today, we're going to be talking about hormone replacement therapy or HRT for high cholesterol in menopause. Does it work and is it safe? Now, what's interesting and sad is that heart attacks and strokes are the leading cause of death in women over the age of 50. And in fact, in this age group, it accounts for over 45% of deaths worldwide. And what we do know is that the declining levels of estrogen as we go into menopause have the effect of increasing total cholesterol, increasing the LDL or bad cholesterol, as well as increasing triglycerides, which are kind of fat in the blood that have been shown to increase our risk of heart attacks and strokes. And also the HDL good cholesterol will go down. So overall, it's not a good effect, but we also have to keep in mind that there's another reason for cholesterol going up as we go into menopause, and that's inflammation. Inflammation in the body that can creep up as we age due to various factors, including lifestyle, diet, exercise, and different aspects of stress and so on, can actually drive up cholesterol through many different pathways that are interconnected. Now, what's interesting is that estrogen helps protect the heart by increasing things like nitric oxide, which improve blood pressure, stabilizing those blood vessels so they're less likely to clot, and providing some anti-inflammatory benefits. So then the question arises, what does the effect of hormone replacement therapy have on cholesterol in menopause? Does it help or does it hurt? And we do have science to help answer this question. Now, when we look at the research in its totality, estrogen therapy in women who are postmenopause has been shown to lower LDL cholesterol and increase HDL cholesterol, which is overall what we want. Now, the impact, however, on cholesterol and inflammation varies based on the type of estrogen therapy that is used. So it's not that any kind of estrogen hormone therapy is helpful in this situation. It has to be specific. And we're going to go over the specificity of what you need to know. So the first question is, is the oral estrogen or the transdermal estrogen best? So oral estrogen is when you take the estrogen by mouth. Transdermal estrogen is when you put it on the skin as a cream or a patch. And so the question is, is there a difference? And if so, which one is better? And in fact, there is a difference. Now, both oral and transdermal estrogen have been shown to improve things like blood pressure and lower LDL cholesterol and raise HDL cholesterol. However, Oral estrogen will actually increase markers of inflammation. In the studies, they use markers like high-sensitivity CRP, looking at the blood of people who are taking the oral estrogen, and that marker goes up, which is really concerning for inflammation. Whereas when we use transdermal estrogen, the HSCRP and other markers of inflammation do not go up. Why is that? Well, when we take estrogen by mouth, the estrogen is absorbed through the gut, it goes into the blood and to the liver, and the liver has to work at breaking down the estrogen. It's called the first pass effect. It'll first go to the liver before it goes anywhere else in the body. And that causes an inflammatory reaction. Whereas if you put it in the skin and it you know, diffuses across the skin into the body, it does not go to the liver so significantly. It just goes into the tissues and has its effect. And therefore, it has a completely different effect compared to oral estrogen, which does go through the liver. So overall, we should not be using oral estrogen when we're looking at things like, does it increase inflammation or not? Because oral estrogen will increase inflammation in the body and transdermal estrogen will not. And if that wasn't enough, Oral estrogen also increases the risk of blood clots significantly. So thickening and clotting of the blood. And when the blood clots, it can plug up those arteries and that can increase our risk of things like clots in our lungs, clots going into our heart and so on. So we do not want to have blood clots. That can be very damaging clots in the veins and the legs. So we overall do not want to increase inflammation or increase the risk of blood clots. So in order to 
you do that, we do not want to use oral estrogen. We want to use transdermal estrogen, knowing that it is effective in lowering cholesterol and other effects of hormone therapy that people choose to use hormone therapy for without that increased risk of increased inflammation and increased clotting risk. And what's interesting is that the clotting risk is not zero with transdermal estrogen, but it is significantly less compared to the oral estrogen. So definitely this makes it a safer option. And then people will ask, well, what about progesterone? Because the thing about progesterone is that progesterone is not the thing that is lowering cholesterol. So estrogen is a therapy that we would use for the purpose of lowering cholesterol, but progesterone is needed when women who are taking estrogen still have a uterus, because if we take estrogen without progesterone and we have a uterus, that estrogen without progesterone is called unopposed estrogen can cause thickening of the uterus and potentially increase our risk of endometrial cancer. So uterine cancer. So when you're taking estrogen, so for example, transdermal estrogen, you have to take either oral progesterone or vaginal progesterone for it to be in doses high enough and strong enough to prevent that effect on the uterus. Transdermal progesterone is not strong enough and not effective enough to protect the uterus. Now, studies on non-bioidentical progesterone given by mouth, like the most popular progesterone that was used in the previous older, larger studies like the Women's Health Initiative, things like Medro, it's called medroxyprogesterone acetate or MPA, show that this was the type of hormone that increased the risk of breast cancer in those participants. And not only that, this non-bioidentical oral progesterone actually worsens cholesterol, it takes away some of the beneficial effects of estrogen. So we do not want to use oral non-bioidentical progesterone. And that means that a lot of those large trials, like the Women's Health Initiative that brought up the concern of breast cancer, which we now know was from the non-bioidentical progesterone, as well as very large studies like the heart and estrogen progestin replacement study called the HERS trial, they used these non-bioidentical progestins or progesterones, which means that unfortunately, we have to disregard the results of those studies when it comes to cholesterol in the women who use these non-bioidentical progesterones. So we're going to be looking only at studies that did not use these non-bioidentical progesterones in order to decide what kind of progesterone should we be using to, you know, at least not interfere with the benefits of estrogen and potentially give us some benefits as well. So it looks like when we look at those studies in particular, the safer progesterone option is oral bioidentical micronized progesterone or vaginal progesterone. So the oral micronized progesterone is basically a bioidentical progesterone. So bioidentical means it looks exactly like the progesterone that your body makes. Non-bioidentical is a progesterone that does not look exactly like what your body makes. So intuitively, it makes sense that bioidentical would be better. And the study showed that this is the case. There was a 2010 study called the E3N study that followed over 80,000 French women for 10 years. And what they found was that the oral bioidentical micronized progesterone, and so an example of that is Prometrium, which is covered by many insurance companies in North America. So just because it's bioidentical doesn't mean you have to pay for it out of pocket. Doesn't mean it has to be compounded or made at your local pharmacy. There are commercially available options like Prometrium, and these did not increase the risk of blood clots, but the non-bioidentical did. So we have to make sure that we're using a specific kind of progesterone and a specific kind of estrogen if we want to have the beneficial effects without the negative effects. So in summary, progesterone is best taken orally by mouth as bioidentical micronized or vaginally, depending on individual needs. What would determine whether you take it orally or vaginally? Well, if you're taking it orally, it may be because oral progesterone also helps with sleep. So if you're having problems with sleep, you may choose to take that oral progesterone. But if you're having problems with vaginal health or you want to protect your vaginal tissues from the thinning and atrophy, that loss of you know, lubrication that can happen with menopause, then you can also do the progesterone vaginally, which can help. And either the vaginal progesterone or the oral progesterone will help protect that uterus as you're taking your estrogen. If you don't have a uterus, 
you might choose to use oral progesterone for sleep or vaginal progesterone for vaginal health, but you wouldn't be needing it to protect your uterus. Now, the question sometimes comes up about testosterone and cholesterol. And what's very fascinating is that when you take testosterone orally, it can actually increase LDL, the bad cholesterol, and lower the good HDL cholesterol. But if you take it transdermally, again, as a patch or as a cream, it does not have this negative effect on cholesterol. So testosterone won't help cholesterol, but if you're taking it, you want to take it transdermally as well, just like your estrogen, so it doesn't actually make your cholesterol worse. Now, the question that many people ask is, well, okay, estrogen, as long as it's transdermal, could lower cholesterol without increasing inflammation, but will it actually prevent a heart attack? And that's a very important question because maybe we're lowering cholesterol, but we're getting the same amount of heart attacks. Now, the thing is that right now there isn't research on transdermal estrogen to answer this question. There's not large enough studies to answer this question. And so the studies that we have to look at this are done with the oral estrogen, which if you recall, lowers cholesterol, but increases inflammation. And this may be why those studies, which are called prevention studies, preventing heart attacks, actually don't show a very strong effect. So let's take a look at those. So for women who've never had heart disease in the past, as in they've never had a stroke, that's called primary prevention. These trials that looked at oral estrogen found that even taking the oral estrogen did slow the thickening of the artery, which when the artery thickens, that increases your risk of stroke. And this effect was better if the woman was not taking a statin medication for cholesterol. So the protective effect of estrogen seems to be better when the woman is not taking a statin medication for high cholesterol. Now, that was an interesting finding. The other study that can guide us with respect to estrogen in general, knowing that transdermal estrogen is at least as good as oral estrogen, and this study was on oral estrogen, it's called the early versus late intervention trial with estradiol. And this showed that women who started oral estrogen within six years of menopause, so not later, so not seven, eight, or nine, or 10 years after menopause, but one, two, three, four, five, six years after menopause, had less artery thickening compared to those who started it later. So there seems to be this golden window of opportunity where if you're going to start hormone replacement therapy, it's better if you start it sooner. Now, it doesn't mean it won't work if you start it later, but it does mean it's better if you start it sooner within six years of menopause. Now, let's say you've had a heart attack in the past. So then it's called secondary prevention. And what they found is the study called Estrogen Therapy for Prevention of Reinfarction in Postmenopause Women Trial tested this. And the results showed no significant benefit, as in the oral estrogen did not help prevent the women from getting another heart attack. Not to mean that they would get one, but they would take the groups, you know, the women divide them into two groups, give one woman the oral estrogen, the other woman would not get the oral estrogen. And the rate of heart attacks, how many women in each group had a heart attack were similar. But remember, this was with oral estrogen. So it could be that the transdermal estrogen is better because it lowers cholesterol and it doesn't increase inflammation. And increasing inflammation increases your risk of heart attack, even if your cholesterol is normal. We know that. So future studies need to use transdermal estrogen. And if they're using progesterone, the bioidentical oral micronized progesterone, in order to properly answer the question, will taking hormone replacement therapy reduce our risk of heart attacks or having a repeat heart attack. So for now, what we can say with a certain amount of confidence, because studies are always, you know, suggestions, not final facts, is that transdermal estrogen, estradiol, which is the bioidentical estrogen, improves cholesterol without increasing inflammation. And given the studies on oral estrogen, it is likely that the transdermal estrogen will decrease the risk of a first heart attack as well. And future studies might show that it'll decrease the risk of a second heart attack, given that it doesn't increase inflammation the way that oral estrogen does. And again, progesterone is 
if taken, is best taken orally as that bioidentical micronized progesterone and or vaginally, depending on those individual needs, like I mentioned before. Testosterone, if used, should not be taken orally, should be taken topically, transdermally as a cream or a patch, for example, or vaginally as well would be another option. Now, the thing I want to say is that a lot of women start taking hormone replacement therapy and they forget the fact that you need to have really healthy liver and gut health, really good gut health and liver health in order to take hormone replacement therapy. Because if you don't, if there's an issue with that, your body will not be able to take that estrogen, for example, properly break it down once it's used it and then get rid of it. And that process occurs through the liver and the liver breaks it down, puts it into the bile, the bile gets dumped into the gut, and then the gut has to poop it out. And that breakdown product of estrogen, certain products of that broken down estrogen are actually quite toxic and harmful and can increase our risk of breast cancer. So if we're not properly breaking it down in the liver and putting in the bile and dumping into the gut, or if we're constipated and we're holding on to that poop and that toxic estrogen is being reabsorbed, or if our gut microbiome is unhealthy and that microbiome is responsible and a part of the system of getting rid of the estrogen, it's called the strabolome when it's that part of the gut microbiome we're talking about. If there's any issues with gut microbiome health due to usually lifestyle issues with diet, stress, previous use of medications, antibiotics, those kinds of things can interfere with that process. So remember, using hormone replacement therapy is part of a holistic strategy to uplevel your health if you're going to use it. And you need to be sure that all of those pieces of the puzzle have been addressed. Now, for that reason, I'm going to put in the caption of the show. So if you look below the video into the notes, you might have to click on the more button if you're on YouTube, for example. And I'm going to put some resources for you, including my high cholesterol playlist that looks at nutrition, exercises and supplements that also help reduce cholesterol. And I'll put some links for other playlists like gut health and my total guide, my complete guide on hormone replacement therapy if you want to do a deeper dive. So remember, it's rarely that one thing will be the big fix for you. It's often other things that need to be taken into consideration. And so I hope that you get much use and value out of these resources. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, save, and share. Head on over to YouTube and do that. That's the best way to support The Wild Wisdom Show. If you enjoyed this, also share this. Sharing is caring, and you never know when someone's going to benefit from this wild wisdom. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, evening, or night, depending on when you catch this. See you next time.